name is Tom Black. I'm a developer, designer, product strategist, a little bit of everything to make things happen. Uh, you can find me online, most places at BlackTM, GitHub, Twitter. And I use Ruby for both work and fun, but I'm going to talk about the later. Uh, so before we get started, also, I'm going to put notes up for this. It's going to be code samples and links, and so just so you don't have to keep track of all this stuff, it'll be in one place afterwards. Uh, today I'm going to talk about some of my experiences and thoughts about how we can reimagine, rethink 2D graphics and game development. And so for me, this journey started here in, in New York City, uh, particularly in the Flatiron District. I was spending a lot of time. Uh, and I was new to the city, sort of taking it all in, meeting people. And this whole, uh, around 2012, this Learn to Code movement was like at, at its peak, sort of, when the mayor was, was about to learn to code. Uh, but it was exciting for me, just despite all kind of the hype. Uh, and it, was, it was tough for me to learn, and I was really excited to share uh, that experience with others, help them out, be a mentor, all the things like I kind of didn't have uh, to get back in my way. And so I'd go to meetups and after school programs, boot ups, camps, <laughs> like this one, Flatiron School. Uh, this is their first campus. Talked about the community too, I think, in, in this talk, so a while ago. Uh, and with teaching, I, I sort of noticed something. This is a, sort of the pattern that everybody's doing. This is the paradigm. It was terminal and keyboard, and it's pretty familiar to us, and that's how we make software. But it, you know, when you're learning, it's sort of kind of limiting. Like, this is all computers can do. It's kind of this old paradigm. It reminded me of like computers of yesteryear, like, the ones that you kind of grew up with. And it kind of seemed like not a lot has sort of changed. But uh, in many ways, things have changed a lot. We've got much better visuals. We can see millions of colors, pixels we can't even discern anymore. Uh, rich audio, speakers built in. We've got still the keyboard of yesteryear, which we'll probably have forever. Uh, but also speakers, real, real sound. And we can uh, have all sorts of different input devices connect things. And so uh, there's just there's a lot you can do. And this, what's nice about this is it maps well to real learning styles. This is how people actually actually learn. Uh, visual, auditory, aesthetic, things people can see, hear, touch. That's how real learning takes place. And so I was really interested in figuring out how do we take that experience, all, all of those sort of senses, and bring that into something that could teach using Ruby and make it more uh, accessible. And so in 2012, I made this demo, it's kind of a vision. I imagined you could go into the terminal, kind of still like you usually do, type in some stuff, but see results. Kind of happen on the screen. And maybe build up some skills and use more kind of constructs there and see things happen. Maybe make some mini games or something and uh, some fish. And then plug in other device controllers and kind of jump around. I think this is a Rubio character or something. So, you know, just a much more interactive learning environment. And so that was sort of the vision. It was built with real code and real uh, Ruby libraries, actually. Uh, to just sort of help validate this idea. But like every good prototype, it's really a facade, a trick. You know, it's there to validate idea, an idea, but uh, it really nothing more. So I kind of tested it out, play tested it, see how people would learn, just to kind of get some feedback. And that was enough to convince me to kind of dig in and see if I can build something a little bit more. So I did some research to see just sort of what was out there. Was anybody else thinking about this stuff? Were people developing graphics? And, stuff broadly in the Ruby community, and it turns out they are. And actually, I'm going back to like 2000, so uh, a pretty rich history. And there's a lot of ideas in here. There's things that are kind of used for just graphics, some for GUI things, a lot of different approaches. There's a kind of a neat mix to see. So I kind of thought, well, what would be my must-haves if I were to like choose one of these or mix it up or take ideas? What, what would that sort of look like? Well. We probably want to have cross-platform, native and web, make this stuff easy to understand internally. That's kind of nice to learn. You could do something and then see how it might work on the inside. Uh, you can make real things, so it's not just like a lot of sandboxes that we, that we would see. It could be good for a lot of different things, not just education, but like you could make a real game, or you could kind of like you know, throw your own skills there. Uh, and it would just be easy to get started. You know, the quicker you get to having an idea to seeing it, interacting with it, is, is pretty critical. And so, uh, and, and just making it inviting it. 
So I thought, you know, this is kind of a hefty list, but, um, you know, starting something new, thinking about how we could uh, take some existing ideas and mash them together. Uh, there's a lot of positives to that. You get to build on many ideas, incorporate new tech and methods and so forth. Uh, revisit these fundamentals. You can kind of say, like, do these things need to exist, or is this kind of an outdated approach? Uh, you've got the freedom to experiment. For me, it was nice because I wanted to gain new skills. This is a weird, kind of, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people do web stuff. That's how, probably how we got into Ruby, so I wanted to get delved into this new area. But the downside is there's a lot to learn to do. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a big negative. But, but I persevered here and uh, thought, well, where do I start? And, you know, I thought about the simple, like, starting with the end in mind, what experience could we want in just this, like, and so I thought of this like MVP, minimal viable product, just like a square about new sort of application. And then what would it take to really build that? You know, I know there's some like hardware at the bottom somewhere, but like what, what goes sort of in the middle? There's, I imagine a lot of stuff. Uh, the first thing I did is just kind of broke it down and said, well, what if we just start with a, win a window? That's pretty much the most fundamental thing that you could have. And if you go around and you Google it, you'll find most operating systems provide some low-level library that you can access to make those things. And so uh, this is, on, on the Mac, you have all these NS classes. This is NS window, and if, if you read it, it just says, a window that an app displays on the screen. So I thought, okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> so if you go and do some study and trial and error, you can actually build a window. And this is really all you need to do that. This is a written in Objective-C, and you talk to this Cocoa class, you just kind of say what you want and run it, and or you compile it first, linking to the uh, Cocoa libraries there, and we'll just output it as a window. And if you want to run it, you, this is what you get, basically a window that, that does nothing. But it's a good start, and it, and it works. Uh, from there, there's, there's a lot more to do, so it's not just a window, but you got to put a graphics context in. You got to think about well, how are you going to get inputs in from all these different sources? You're going to manage it. Maybe you're going to talk to other system things, display and uh, system timers. All this, you know, you start to think about all the things you need to develop this experience. Looking ahead, and a lot goes into that. And you know, I, I am on a Mac, but I want to include all operating systems. So you got to do that for. You know, everywhere. So that's what you know, sort of basic windows look like on other platforms. Uh, and a lot of stuff you're going to have to go in. And pretty much it, it starts to become pretty overwhelming when you have to do this. And you think about all the variations and all the rest. It's just, it gets to be where you uh, might be stuck and you start feeling like this. Like there's, there's no end in sight and, you know, this, this could be a dead end. But, but is it? Well, it turns out that uh, thankfully not. Game developers have been thinking about this, these issues for a long time. A lot of these efforts started back in the uh, 20 years ago when they were porting games to Linux. And so, you know, trying to think of the inconsistency between Windows and Linux and then other operating systems, weird things, making these things work everywhere was, was a pretty, uh, pretty big effort. You know, they want their games to run everywhere. And so these are called uh, media libraries. And, or media layers, sort of, because that's exactly what it does. It like kind of puts a smooth layer on top of all these different operating systems, so you can uh, root out all these inconsistencies. Just have like a nice kind of clean API. And when I kind of looked at uh, those are the three major ones, I found uh, SDL to be, which is, stands for the uh, Simple Direct Media Layer, to be the most well-rounded for this project. All the, there's a lot out there, and they're good for different things. But uh, for what we were trying to do, this, this made really sense, uh, and it supports a lot. And there's over 500 uh, cross-platform functions, so you can really do just about it. And it just so happens that it's used by AAA titles and indie games alike, so uh, my general rule is if it's good enough for Half-Life, it's probably good enough for whatever we're doing. So. so this is what it looks like. This is written in, in C. And this is all it takes, basically build a window on every platform. And now we don't have to think about any of these inconsistencies because it's sort of like jamming, jamming at that lower level. Uh, and I have a talk linked about game developer, uh, game developer with uh, SDL, getting out to just So I think we're uh, back on track there. We have a path forward.
Uh, at this point, you might be wondering, like, why, why are we talking about C so much? This was like a Ruby conference. Uh, and isn't it maybe old and crufty and all the rest of it? But it turns out that C is very contemporary. The standard is always evolving. People are building really amazing tools and infrastructure. And it's, if you haven't used it, it's very, it's a, it's a beautifully simple, efficient, and precise language. And while you might not want to build your next like web application in C, that you'd probably have a bad time, uh, it's perfect for programming systems and exchange and all these like lower level things. It's, it's really good for it. And it just so happens that Ruby loves C. Its primary implementation, MRI, but I guess we're calling it C Ruby now, is, uh, is written in C, and, and so is MRuby. And so Ruby has this nice connection with the native world. It means that just because it's an interpreted language, it's not sort of just confined by that label. Uh, so then if we go back to our red square application here, square.new, uh, where are we right now? What do we have? Kind of reviewing what we just talked about. We have an operating system. We know that it provides uh, essential access to uh, hardware and Windows and all the rest. We know that we don't have to think about all operating systems like that. We can use SDL to kind of uh, make that a cool experience. And we can sort of move the hardware out of the way because we don't really need to think about it too explicitly. So that's really nice. But, uh, but what else? What else what we might need to make this possible? Because we're not quite there yet. Well, one of the things we haven't talked about is, is graphics. How do you actually make things visual? Um, well, it turns out, again, we don't have to tra talk directly to hardware. There's a lot of these cross-platform right? graphics APIs. Uh, OpenGL is a common one. It stands for the Open Graphics Layer, and it's for rendering 2D and 3D. Maybe for the Direct 3D or Direct 2D, or Metal is the, the new hot thing on, uh, on Apple platforms. These are all just APIs to talk to graphics and, and kind of to kind of hand over some of those low level things, but provides a nice interface to do that. So from your perspective as a programmer, it looks like writing your C program, you'll make OpenGL calls, usually it's GL, blah, 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 something. In uh, orchestration with the operating system and uh, the graphics uh, libraries on there, it'll talk to the GPU and then finally that so that's a massive oversimplification, but that's just sort of the experience. And we can dive into it and talk about the, the rendering pipeline, as it's known. Uh, this is how rendering works in, in modern graphics programming. And it's important to talk about because we actually have to program these, these things. It's sort of not handed to us. The first thing you have to do is take actual points, things you want to draw. So this is a, a triangle. This is the simplest 2D shape you can basically draw. And uh, all the vertex data, all these points, are described in just, just floating point numbers. So uh, that's, that's what the C array would look like. The next thing we have to write a, a vertex function. This is just, just a function. And it's, it sort of looks like a C language with a few extra things in there. And that, that's where we can actually take those points and map them to a coordinate system, put it anywhere we want. We can even do any kind of manipulation that way, but it's just about the coordinate system. Then also we're going to need a projection. That's like how we see the world. And so in the world that we live in, we have perspective. We can see it's like train tracks fading into the, into the distance to a vanishing point. Uh, but we don't actually need that in 2D. We want to see things in kind of this orthographic way, which means it's a world with no depth. So you can imagine everything you see in the world is being like jammed right in front. So this is kind of what that would look like. So and uh, if we implement that in the graphics world, we would need to write a orthographic matrix, which is not too complicated. It's described here. It's math. And that's a means of, of representing 3D dimensions, basically, in this, in this 2D space. And it's a it's, it's, uh, distance. It's you know, distance from the camera. You can see that in the cube there. Uh, and also, we can do things in this, in this vertex arena, uh, like move the origin to the upper left corner, which is kind of nice because when you expand the this is it goes and change some components there. Then after that, we have this sort of uh, shape, but it's still represented sort of mathematically. We actually have to apply it and figure out like, what pixels do we, do we shade in, and that's called rasterization. And a lot of that's sort of done for you, which is nice. Uh, but then we get to write a, a fragment fun, uh, function to fill in the colors, think about those intermediate values, 
those that interpolation that happens is actually done by the hardware and then all the rest of it will do it for you. But you can choose those points and then it'll kind of figure out what the rest of it looks like. And finally, you have a nice uh, triangle. This so, uh, oh, and the last step is you write this to your memory frame buffer, which is what gets displayed. Uh, write that to the back, but then it gets to swap buffers and it gets put to the floor, and then it happens like 60 times a second if you're lucky. So, it seems pretty easy, I guess, or at least clear. But uh, you know, the graphics program experience is pretty, pretty wild. So uh, you, you feel all of these things at various times. Um, but even when you screw up pretty rat badly, I don't, I don't actually know what this was supposed to be, but it looks like a, like a wallpaper of PNGs or something. I don't know what the rest of it is, but it looks pretty cool. Uh, maybe you could even do art somewhere. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, like an exhibit, just broken graphics. Uh, so this is cool. The, this, this approach works, and now uh, we implemented it in uh, OpenGL, the, the legacy versions, the, the more modern approaches, which uh, I described in the pipeline, and then also for mobile and embedded, it's just the pocket chip. So basically, we can we can draw any approaches. So if we go back to our stack, we see uh, we've got the operating system, SDL, we learned about OpenGL that kind of sits there a little bit. The operating system kind of provides these things, or they're kind of work in concert. Um, and then we have this application code for SDL, event loops, other things, a lot of other things, <laughs> OpenGL calls. Well, that's a lot to kind of just be scattered around. So we can't, can we like package those things to make it a little nicely? And that's kind of what we ended up doing is creating this little side project, which makes that easier. We'll call it Circuit to be. And it's uh, the simple layer written in C to, to do those things. That looks nice. That's the way. And all the files, if you kind of look at it, everything's very explicit. And so you see shapes and images and all of these things. You can kind of look at each file and see what sort of essential there. Uh, and I'll just point out the, the GL, the OpenGL code that we were talking about, that's contained in there. So you can kind of check it out. Uh, and it's uh, really simple. So all you need to draw across platforms is something like this, and uh, really three functions. So you create a window. Show it, and then that'll go in this render, render this to draw a triangle. And you just describe what you want it to look like, and that basically gets it works everywhere, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so now we're at this point where we can add Ruby finally after we put our simple 2D layer on top of that. We've got MRI or C Ruby, and also M Ruby. And uh, are folks familiar with M Ruby or have used it before? Not too much. Okay. <laughs> Well, you should be familiar with it because it's pretty awesome. It's basically the small, lightweight implementation of Ruby, and it's designed for embedded use cases. And for us, it's really important because we can compile Ruby down to machine code. And so uh, there's a lot of ways to do that. But if we take our square.new application, which is important to us, and we run the MRV compiler, we can actually generate this bytecode. This might look crazy, but it's basically this compiled Ruby for, for the uh, MRuby virtual machine. Uh, and then this is this is an example that's actually contained in a C array, which is really good for us because that means we can embed it places. And all you need to do to actually run that is uh, open a context and basically uh, run that. So just, just pass it over. It's, it's a really simple way. <laughs> Not much to So that's great. Uh, so we have then, uh, we'll need to write a native extension because if we're going to talk at the Ruby layer, we need to push those things down. Uh, and we might think that we would need two, but fortunately, uh, we don't, actually. So we can just do this together. Uh, and this was some work, but oops. But uh, we figured it out. We burned it twice. We really didn't want to do it. Uh, so there are differences in the MRI native API and the M3. And so, uh, because of these differences, we kind of have to account for them. But in C, I think this will get easier or, or uh, maybe more consistent in the future. But, uh, but for now, what we did is just map these things. So like if we're in the MRuby world, we just kind of like, that's what these defined things are. This is C stuff, but it makes it nice so you can just uh, choose which one you want here. So just call out that in the bottom, you'll see uh, defining a module, class, and method, and that works for, for both. And then when you call this quad.render, because we're going to need a square eventually, on, uh, so if you have like a quad class, I mean, then you call render on that. 
you would run this function that we have defined somewhere else, and it calls that simple 2D draw function. So it works, and it's, it's pretty simple. So going back to our stack here, we can finally uh, add our Ruby layer. We we'll put the native extension in the gem, and we can sort of celebrate it does. Now we can actually, we have everything we need in the stack to actually do the simple application. Uh, but we did say earlier that we wanted cross-platform and web, so we're not quite done. But that's okay, we can, we can persevere. So what would we actually need to do that? Well, at the very bottom left there, we don't need OpenGL sort of explicitly uh, or SDL because we have a browser. And the browser sort of does a lot of those things. JavaScript APIs, you, know, you can get images, you can load them, you can do all these things. It's pretty provided by the browser. And then WebGL is a version of OpenGL that is designed just for uh, the browser there. And we don't need simple 2D, but we kind of need its, its port in JavaScript. And we can then also cross off uh, both Rubies here because in the Ruby community we also have Opal, which is a is Ruby for the, the web here. Uh, and we don't need the native extension, but we do need an Opal extension. And that's what it looks like sort of simplified there. So if you haven't done any Opal before, uh, like I said, it's Ruby in the browser. What does that mean? Well, if we take our simple uh, square.new application, we can compile this to JavaScript by using a simple Opal command. This is the gem, so you, you then get access to this uh, command tool. Uh, and tool, and then you run this, and it's basically just saying, don't give me the whole library, but just, just focus on this, and compile it to JavaScript, and we'll get this thing, which looks kind of ugly, but it's real JavaScript, and it works, and uh, and it's actually somewhat readable, but we don't need to read it, because it's it's gonna, we can compile it, push it in, and and instead of writing this uh, native extension, like I mentioned, we have a, a uh, Opal extension, which basically will include these things. What's really nice about this, as opposed to the native world, is that it's kind of like a, a foreign function interface built in. An FFI, that's a, basically a way of like talking to another language. And so if you just put backticks in, instead of it sending to the terminal, because it's really not a terminal when you're on the web, they just uh, co-opted it and then used it for just writing kind of explicit JavaScript. So that simple 2D JS thing, you can put in your draw quad right in there, and you're kind of like reopening that that quad class and just kind of adding this one to it, and then what it will do in JavaScript there. So this is what this looks like. Uh, we didn't have time to do this, but there is this thing called WebAssembly on the, on the horizon, and we could employ that think pretty easily, <laughs> so, which is by using the native extensions using mRuby because we can compile it. And so uh, WebAssembly is, is this thing which will take, for now, C and C++ and uh, compile it to this new format, which you can basically run in your browser. So it's like running kind of like a native application in your browser. Uh, and then that's built in with just the, uh, and there might be some other things, but these are the, some of the key pieces that we'll so, if we look at the uh, complete stack here, we've got the operating system, the SDL, the browser kind of filling the, the same thing. Uh, the two layers that kind of make this even more simpler are Ruby stuff layered on top, and then finally, uh, this Ruby 2D thing with native extension and all the rest of it. So this is what the complete sort of package looks like. And it might seem a little complex, but it's got nice separation. Everything does what it's supposed to do, and that's kind of like what we want as, as programmers to us. The right stuff in the right places, and, and they're all kind of fitting together. Uh, so we haven't really talked about this Ruby 2D thing. What's that all about? Well, this is going to be the, uh, the Ruby experience for all of this. Uh, this is a, a gem we're working on, and we're kind of pitching it as uh, interpretive, interpreted native web. Whatever you want to do, you can build cross-platform 2D applications in Ruby. And so what's inside that? Well, it's got classes, as you probably expect. Uh, but here we have the real opportunity to build concepts from these low-level interfaces. So now we can build up these, these tangible things. So, here's a there. so what does one of these classes look like? Well, the essential one is the window. We saw some window examples earlier. This is what it would look like in, in Ruby. This is just kind of abbreviated, but you might 
get or set attributes in the window, and it'll be in this, you'll have this update loop where you can uh, do things, uh, events that you can call upon, show, close, kind of those things. And uh, here's an example of a square. This is actually the full implementation for now. So you can see squares inheriting from a rectangle, that size and color, and it's updating coordinates. So uh, it's pretty simple. And the most fun part for me, and probably creative, is finding uh, you know, opportunities to design this programming experience, this, this like domain-specific language for a, a new domain, like, like gaming and, and graphics. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a little bit of a, of a first. But there are some prior examples of, of folks that have really put effort into thinking what that looked like. Uh, and one that was very inspiring to me was uh, HyperTalk. So, is anybody familiar with, with HyperTalk or HyperCard or those things? Yeah, something really cool. Uh, HyperTalk is a scripting language for HyperCard, and this came out in the, like, 1987. And HyperCard, I'm going to explain it poorly, but it was like a stack-based thing, and you could kind of like early web browser stuff, and you can read about it, and, and you can teach me about it. But, uh, but I was looking at the references and just kind of seeing like what these experiences were like. Uh, there's actually HyperCard and RubyTalk later today, I think, so that's, I'll be going to that to learn more. But the kind of idea here was that you could say things that were very English-like, you know, on, mouse up, play something, sound, and it would just happen. It was a very conscious effort to think about what that intuitive, expressive sort of experience would look like. So, um, so taking some of that inspiration, what could this look like for, uh, for our Ruby world? Well, if we're setting like a cursor to arrow, for example, maybe we could... Well, we actually don't have cursor implemented yet, but say it's a window, setting those attributes would kind of look the same. And then uh, this is the mouse up example I just saw. Maybe that would look like, uh, like this, where one is maybe the sound and it's a somewhere else, so kind of a, a Ruby kind of way that. And then key events or other kind of events, we could capture those symbols, sort of filter them out, and then say, okay, we've got an event. And then you can kind of crack it open and see what's inside, and then figure out what you want to do with that. So, pretty nice. So here's the simplest 2D app you can uh, really write in Ruby 2D, and this will just create a 640 by 480 window. You just require it, show it, and that's pretty darn simple. I can't think of any, anything else to remove, really. And this is what our uh, square.new app looks like. If you want this, you'll, you'll get that. The window's a little bit bigger than the previous examples, but. Uh, <coughs> Before 80, but again, you can set it to be whatever you want. Here's a test card, which you might be familiar with. I, I like test cards because you can quickly see if kind of everything's working. You know, we like to write unit tests, but if you're going to do games and graphics, there's not a whole lot of testing is interesting in games, so I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Because you kind of have to play test things, you have to see things work, and things will fail in ways that you kind of didn't expect, but you're going to catch it in kind of automated ways. So we wrote a test card uh, for a little Ruby 2D application. Kind of see things working. A little more crazy shards and like things happen, so that's good. And uh, all this this gem can do a lot. Uh, it can automatically detect virtually any controller, even ones that you kind of hot plug in, so the wired, wireless, whatever. And I'd love to take credit for for uh, figuring all of that out, but really that's from like SDL. You know, like the, they're all motivated to do this. They they want their controllers working. And so there's a giant community of people who are like, oh, who, who bought this controller? Let's make sure that it works, all the mappings are correct and the rest of it, so we can take advantage of that. Uh, and then write a really simple interface to, to do with that. So you can do something awesome here. Uh, and this maps to, so even if you have a crazy controller, and I always travel now with like at least two, which makes me look a little crazy at the airport, but uh, controllers all look different. And you know, some have, whatever they're called. <laughs> different joysticks, buttons, things are laid out differently. This is a iBuffalo, a brand name I think you're all aware of. Uh, and this one's kind of used for like iOS devices and things. And so uh, you can all, what we do is we map them to a common like generic Xbox interface. Or at least that's what uh, SDL does. And we kind of work with that. So that's what happened. Uh, the other things we do are we can build for uh, build these native platforms. If you write your Ruby app, app.rb or something, you can say build it as a native app or for the web or for iOS. 
or QB at least, have its same experience. So that's what this looks like on iOS here. Build it, and from the same uh, command, you can launch it as well. So when that goes through, you'll see, this is not the full test card, but it's something that we can kind of modify it so at least it can stretch in weird ways. But you can see, it, at least it works. <laughs> so how is that possible? Well, all of this gets put in a single C file where we have our native extension. We have your application's bytecode that's been compiled down. And then this Ruby 2G, 2D gems bytecode in there, all in a single file. It's in C, which means it's still not machine code, which is what we want, because then we can uh, basically put it in an Xcode project, get the right libraries in there, and they're linked to the right things and so forth. And you can see here, if you look at the frameworks, we actually have another repo where we can build mRuby uh, into a framework, and then we have this. So those are the only two ones that are not. And we don't really have like a good publishing uh, plan there, but you can basically open this open Xcode and, and publish your app from the App Store. I mean, I think that the, the distance there is in two years, so that's good. So as we've sort of seen here, Ruby can really help us rethink what's possible, reimagine everything, not just at the, at the DSL level, which is what it's, I think, really good at, but even like the entire stack, and that was surprising to me. We just scratched the surface here, but uh, there's links to, there's been a lot of talks at uh, around various places around game development, Ruby and all these uh, topics, and so I've linked to all those. And, uh, but, but yeah, was, I think really the beginning. Uh, and, you know, I think we've, we've talked about how we can really, uh, education, gaming, graphics, all these kind of tie together. And so there's, there's one more demo that I want to show that kind of uh, combine, combines it all here. And uh, to do that, we're going to have to put Ruby into, into space. I'll show you a little, uh, this is an n-body simulation, if any like physics or, or uh, astronomy nerds out there. So these are celestial bodies that are interacting in space and their gravity is kind of attracting one another. Um, and their color is actually mapped to velocity here. And here's another example where the cursor is actually a single point of gravity and we're just sort of directing it across. The I could just like play with this all day. I tried all these different like variations and things. So, I think there's uh, many possibilities for Ruby, and I think we'll hear a lot about that. I'm really excited about this Ruby on the Fringe uh, track, because I think we'll hear a lot of a lot of new ideas. Uh, this is a small but uh, growing, supportive community. People who are messing around with graphics and games and all the rest of it. So, uh, please join us, hang out. And I'll, I'll share some links and ways that you can do that. Uh, and overall, I think the, the future is, is bright for us here. So, thanks so much for having me. The notes will be here. And, uh, I think that's